Well, Leeds has been very fortunate in the architects who in the second half of the 19th century played their part in the improvement of the city, in transforming it into the handsome city that it became. And taking the lead in that was the architect George Corson, who I'm going to talk about today. He was in practice for 50 years in Leeds, and he undertook a range of projects, a range of buildings, from big public buildings, churches, schools, through to warehouses, business premises, shops, and smaller domestic buildings, houses for the wealthy, escaping out of the center of Leeds into the suburbs. A lot of his work is still there, though some has gone, unfortunately his churches have gone, uh, but they're there for us still to enjoy. And if you make a visit into Leeds, if you go to the Central Library, if you have your coffee in the Tiled Hall, if you go to a performance at the Grand Theatre, or if you just wander around the city centre or out to the suburbs, you'll see his work. And so we're going to look at some of that work now and talk about his career and how it developed, the important relationships he made with some of the people in Leeds who played significant parts in its history. He wasn't a Leeds man in origin. He came originally as a young man from Scotland. Here's a picture of him. I haven't got a picture of him as a young man, so here he is in mature life. But he was only 20 when he arrived in Leeds. He was born here in Dumfries, southwest Scotland, in 1829, fourth son of James Corson, the provost, who died, however, when he was quite young. But there was money in the family. It was a distinguished family with a history. And he was able to go to Dumfries Academy and then on to be apprenticed to an architect. This was obviously the career that he and his older brother were wanted to follow. Just a glimpse of some of the architecture of Dumfries. And you see these turrets, columns, tall gables. We often find this, this sort of Scots baronial style echoed in his later work. So a very early influence. This is the architect, Walter Newell, who he was apprenticed to. He was the premier architect of the area. And it seems that not only did these two brothers study with him, but others who turn up later in Leeds were from the same stable. So it was a training ground for young architects who were going to go elsewhere, leave Scotland, go to the north, where there was a great explosion of population, a need for more building, opportunities for young architects to make their name. He arrived in Leeds when he was around 20, and he joined his brother, who had already been there for a few years. And they lodged initially in this house. It's on the university campus in Midden Terrace. But their office was elsewhere in Albion Place. It's Bob now, that particular building. And at that point, William Corson, his brother, was in partnership with the man on the left here, Edward Latrobe Bateman, who became very well known later as a designer and artist, had links with the Pre-Raphaelites, and he was there as a partner for William Corson in those early years. It, the, the partnership finished in 1851, so quite soon after George Corson arrived. But both William Corson and Latrobe Bateman are said to have trained in London uh, and been linked with the influential designer, architect, Owen Jones. And that's him on the right here. 
Owen Jones uh, was well known later on as the designer of the, the interior of the Crystal Palace for the Great Exhibition in 1851. And in fact, William Coulson himself put in an entry for that design competition among a couple of hundred others. Um, and he retained links with London. Uh, he's reported as having uh, been involved in an exhibition, an architectural exhibition in London at a later stage. So there are links there uh, with London and with Owen Jones. And Owen Jones also very famous for his influential publication, Plans and Elevations of the Alhambra, which uh, we know that William Corson had a copy of this really wonderful book, which was he lent to for people to look at at one of the philandic conversaciones, a social event where people brought in their treasures to show other people. And in 1848, William Corson brought in this book, which had a great influence on architects of the period and certainly on George Paulson, you can see the influence in later, in later work. This is just a page from it showing the, the very detailed patterns and colors and designs from the Alhambra that were a revelation really to people working in, in architecture at the time in England. I should mention perhaps that a copy of this book is in the Leeds Library, but is also in the public library. So you can go and look at it if you're interested. It's in the art library in Leeds. 1853 to 1871, they moved to South Parade. Uh, that building has gone now, but you can see it here on the left. And it was their office and it was also their home with their mid widowed mother uh, until 1860. Uh, so that was where they operated from. We know that they undertook a range of different buildings, but it was always still under William Corson's name, not under George Corson's own name. But it's clear that he was involved both in building warehouses for the Luttons firm and in other projects around the town. One of the most important ones was this one in 1853, when the firm was commissioned by Francis William Peckley to design a new brewery for, the, for Joshua Teckley and Sons. And that was the beginning of a very long-term commitment and connection between the Corsons, George Corson in particular, who I think would have been the person who worked primarily on this building uh, as the assistant to William. And uh, that connection went on for many, many years, as we'll see later on. 1858, just towards the end of that period, when George Paulson was in training, basically, his name not appearing mostly. Um, and we know that he went to the Great Exhibition and that he traveled uh, uh, abroad, traveled in Europe, uh, doing his studying alongside the work with his brother. But in 1858, William Corson had now taken over a new practice, a different practice in Manchester. So he was mostly from then on in Manchester. He took over the business, in fact, of another Dumfries trained architect called Grogan. And George Corson, for the first time, appears as the architect in his own name. So these warehouses that were built in Wellington Street, very close to the station, Wellington Street was suddenly from 1850 onwards. Uh, developed with warehousing and offices because of the arrival of the train of the station of Central Station in Wellington Street. And as you see, these warehouses are not just plain functional building buildings, they are decorated, they're showing arches. And up at the top, 
um, the elements of Moorish design in the two colored stone, uh, the columns, the granite columns and so on. So they, they have elegance, they're not just functional buildings. Here's another of them. Some of you will recognize it. It's on the corner of King Street and that was built for William Ledyard, a cloth merchant. <coughs> Around this time, with William gone to Manchester, George moved out to Leafy Headingley, uh, and he rented this house, which is in St George's Terrace, it backs onto Monkey Road. Uh, his mother initially kept house for him, and then his spinster sister uh, when his mother died. And this is to be his home for the next 10 years until he is able to build his own house in Headingley, as we shall see. So these 1860s, he's now on his own and he's beginning to spread his wings. He joins all sorts of establishment associations. He joins the Leeds Library, following on with his, from his brother. He joins the Leeds Phil and Lit. Uh, he joins the Leeds Club. So he's becoming part, he's networking really with people who are going to be his clients of the future. Here, Francis Te William Techley, the Techley who led the new building that he was involved in earlier, commissioned him to build him a new house at Wheatwood. So this is him moving now into domestic building. This is the house, Fox Hill, it's now Moreland School, uh, the central tower in the middle there was originally much taller, very grandiose. Uh, Derek Lindstrom called it Wagnerian splendor. Uh, it's very tall, imposing. Now, of course, rather dark with its darker stone, but it won't have been originally. Very impressive doorway with the Tetley crest. And one of George Corson's strong principles was the importance of first impressions of doorways and porches, of depth, of shadow uh, and carving around. Here's the tall roof, the tall chimneys, adding to a sense of grandeur. And all connected with that, the building of the house was the commission to build new premises for Tetley. These very beautiful drawings were published later by another architect who wrote about Paulson's work, Butler Wilson. And here are the drawings of the new brewery done by Paulson. And he was to remain Tetley's architect for 40 years. And somebody comments that while all this building was going on, he was practically resident on the site, another of these drawings. But he was branching out in other directions as well. This church uh, down at Camp Road, Little London, down in Little London, which was an ex a greatly expanding area with new population, and the church needed extension. Uh, it did in fact acquire a tower earlier, and then he added various transepts, new vestry and porch, a pulpit. He gave a beautifully carved lectern to the church, and he won a lot of praise in the press. So this was a new area of work for him. And in town, another new area of work here. Uh, this was the design for John Hepper's auction house in East Parade in 1863. This drawing was published in The Builder uh, and was much admired. A very distinctive, decorative facade. Uh, Hepper was doing very well. I mean, there was a property boom going on. Uh, so he needed new premises. And this was a standout design for his new auction house. This is how it's still there. Uh, this is how it looked a few years ago when I took this photograph. Some of you will remember Bonham's 
was based there, so it went on being an auction house for a long time. The windows on the ground floor had been changed much earlier to let in more light. Uh, but otherwise, the building is there very much as George Lawson designed it. Inside, it's now a very upmarket restaurant, uh, this uh, main room, this 50 foot long room, which the newspapers at the time said with admiration was lighted from the roof uh, with vents for air. You can still see that uh, light glass roof put in there. These buildings in Leeds, and there are many of them that have quite narrow frontages, but go back very deeply, of course, need light provided from above. And we see this in this design here by George Coulson for Hepper. Uh, and the newspapers commented too on his good acoustics and the fine services that had been provided. There was a yard at the back for horses. Uh, all of these aspects of the work of the auction house were paid careful attention by George Corson. He was very good at meeting his clients' needs, assessing and meeting, discussing presumably what was essential for the client. This is the doorway, beautifully carved, still there. Just This is a fairly recent photograph. And you can see the fine carving, the columns, and the beautiful ironwork, too, uh, of the entrance to the building. Out in the suburbs, he also, for John Hepper, built his house, which was one of the first that was built in the old zoological gardens. But you can see how very different this design is. It's in brick. It's very plain and simple and straightforward. So quite a contrast to the elaborate facade of the auction rooms. And back in town, another of the successful business people of the time. This is a photographic studio. It's just behind the town hall next to the Victoria Hotel. And uh, you can see here again, these Moorish elements, uh, these elements of decoration. And up at the top, there is in fact, again, a glass roof, and that is to provide a daylight studio for the Wormalds. Uh, for portrait sitting so that they had good light for their portraits. We're talking before electricity, of course, when gas was the only lighting otherwise. And uh, just worth mentioning that the Wormholes did a wonderful set of photographs. They did a lot of photography around the town as it changed and developed and was improved. And uh, there's a very fine set of photographs called Views of Old Leeds, uh, present in a sort of presentation box, which the Thorsby Society and the Central Library, I think there are only those two copies are available for people to look at if they want to. Just near the town hall too, uh, near the infirmary was the medical school in Park Street Again, using features that you've seen before, the multicolored stonework, the columns, uh, the pointed arches, the tall gables. Um, this building has been demolished, but I've included it here because it was the home for the Thorsby Society for 20 years and uh, 30, nearly 30 years. And it's, uh, it's gone now, but it was, in its time, very much admired, um, very carefully, again, designed to meet the needs for medical training. And again in town, in Commercial Street, was this building. You'll see some similarities with the other uh, shop fronts we've seen. Um, wonderful entrance with columns, and apparently capitals carved with medicinal plants to recognize the chemists, the chemists that were there. This shop's a very well-known shop that dealt not only in pharmaceutical things, but also in photographic equipment, which of course was being newly developed at that time. 
It was much admired at the time and even into the 1930s, the original fittings inside the shop were still there as well as the carvings. But now I'm afraid this is what it looks like and only the top half reflects the Corton building and the bottom half, everything seems to have vanished. Round the corner in Park Row, here you see how very different he can style uh, his buildings. So this was chosen in a very different style of uh, architecture in classical, plain. And this is a picture from the 1930s of it. It was built for the Scottish Widows Fund. It harmonized, he pointed out, with the Bank of England that had just been built opposite. And this is how it looks now, virtually unchanged. And uh, it's worth looking, looking at it a little more closely. Here's the doorway, again, this important doorway with beautiful carvings. The carving here, as in Hepper House, and indeed as on the town hall, were by the Leeds firm of Moore and Ingle, and uh, who had their stone mason's yard not very far away from the town hall, uh, and not very far away from George Coulson's office. He believed, it's clear, in getting the highest quality of carvings. So here we see these beautiful carving round the door, very elaborate with the heads. I'm not quite sure what the head represent, possibly the windows, uh, but over the door, over the windows as well, you see this fine carving and the initials of the Scottish Widows Fund. Worth taking a close look at. Then further church work. So in 1868, St. Clement's Church, Sheep Scar, which again has been demolished, was built, funded by the Church Extension Society, but the tower, this very dramatic uh, high tower, was paid for by local subscription. And this one, again, a great deal of praise in the press, and George Coulson was obviously proud of it. He exhibited the plans at one of the meetings of the Leeds Phil and Lit. And just a year later, another of his churches, a, a simpler, straightforward design, again, funded by the Church Extension Society, um, but no local subscription for a tower. So there was just a belfry and that too has been demolished. So all those churches that he worked on have gone. Now around, 1869, at the end of this decade, where he's doing obviously extremely well, he started to buy some property in Headingley. There was Cardigan land, Lord Cardigan had died in 1868, and land was being offered for sale to people. He bought several plots of land. It's been suggested that he actually laid out plans for an estate for the Cardigan, uh, people to, to develop land there, but that's, I've never found any evidence that that actually happened. He did at this period, in fact, lay out an estate uh, for the Luptons uh, over in Chapel Allerton, but the Newton Park estate. But there's no evidence that he actually did do this in Headingley. Uh, it's quite likely that the Cardigan agents themselves did that. But he did buy land, and this is St Ives, it's still there on Wood Lane, it was initially a school, and then it was Colonel Harding's home. Tall, again, a very tall, imposing house on something of a hill there, looking over the view of Meanwood Valley. And right next door, he built his own house. He built St Ives a little bit first, presumably to get some money back and then he built his own house. And this is, we have pictures of his house from when it was sold later on. So this is one frontage, very elaborate, elaborate very extravagant and beautifully fitted out. Three reception rooms, six bedrooms, all with wash basins, which was quite a, a new thing at that time. 
uh, rooms for servants in the attics and so on. Here's the other side of it. And it was featured in architectural journals that showed the homes of architects. So it was a showcase for all his skills. And he was to live there for the next 30 years until his retirement. And the motto over the door interested me. It was keep within compass, so shall ye be sure, which suggests something of his personality. He didn't range very widely. He didn't do very much outside leads. He kept within his compass and he was confident in what he was doing. That's all that's left of Dunern now on Wood Lane because it was demolished in the 70s. So there's just a, a splendidly large gatepost remaining. So the 70s are really the time when he's at the peak of his career. He moved offices to bigger offices in Cookridge Street. Uh, part of this has disappeared now, but it, some of it is still there. And he was very close to some of the stonemasons who were working and with whom he worked himself on various projects. And one of his exciting projects really in the early 1870s was this new music rooms in Park Row Unfortunately, again, it's been demolished now, um, but I wanted to show it because it shows the way he responds to clients' uh, wishes and the kind of work that they do. So that's, you can see the decorative frontage of it there. Incidentally, looking down, you're looking, well, up really, Park Row towards Cookbridge Street, and you see there at the end in this picture, the old cathedral, St Anne's Cathedral, uh, before it was moved to widen and Cookbridge Street into a tram route. Uh, it was George Corson, in fact, who had, of course, offices in Cookbridge Street, who wanted, who, who made a case for the removal of the old cathedral to a new site round to the side that opened up Cookbridge Street. So that was one of his interests. Here's the drawing of the Ramsden, Archibald Ramsden's music rooms, the design that was published in The Architect uh, with stone and granite and this special feature of the great piano showroom. And you can see this here on Archibald Ramsden's advertisement, uh, a great 100 foot showroom lit again by glass above and full of pianos. Uh, Ramsden organized concerts. Uh, he was appointed, as it said, Queen Victoria to supply pianos and harmoniums. And he was a great proponent of everybody having a piano, a piano in every parlor. Uh, he was a good salesman. There were other opportunities in the 1870s. The school board had been established with power to build schools where they were needed. In many areas of Leeds, they were. And George Corson had a hand in a couple of these. This is the first one, in fact, the Bewerley Street is on now, board school. And you can see some features of Corson's work here in the rounded arches, the columns, uh, it's not, a, it's not just a functional building. And he gave careful attention to the need for ventilation, heating, good lighting, and so on. Again, winning a lot of good commentary. And then a very different competition was offered for the council had just bought the land that became Roundhay Park. Uh, amid a lot of controversy about the costs and the distance of Roundhay Park from the centre and so on. But anyway, they bought it and then it, they wanted it to be laid out as a public park with part of it put aside for villa development to help meet the costs involved were very high. And for this competition, Corson produced an album, an album of drawings and designs and a commentary. And 
Salisbury Society has a copy of this splendid album. Uh, I've just put in a couple of pages from it here showing little, these are little seating areas that he's suggesting for around the park. Here's the view that would be over the grounds of the park from the housing development. What he said he was trying to do was to retain the natural beauty of the park and bring the surrounding estate, the housing estate, into harmony with it. So this album, full of his drawings and his comments, uh, is available for people to look at. And then he's another of these buildings for the wealthy out in Headingley, like Foxwood at, East, at uh, Wheatwood, Spenfield in Ockley Road for Oxley, the banker and art collector. It's a relatively, this was a building, the plan that was published, the drawing that was published. Here it is now, uh, cleaned up. In fact, it's looking back to the colour that it would have been originally. The additional building at the side to the left there is the, bill the billiard room, which was a later addition in the 1890s. The house was two-star listed. It has now been converted into apartments. Inside, there's the, well, again one of his rather handsome doorways into it. Inside, it was a riot of colour and decoration. I remember going into it, well, long ago now, before, of course, the, the conversion into apartments, and it was a bit like stepping into some Arabic palace uh, full of colour and pattern. I just put in here, uh, thinking of Owen Jones and the influence that he may have had on Corson, that form without colour is like a body without a soul. And here you feel this kind of rich colour, and you find that in other interiors of Corson's, this interest in colour, richness, decoration, elaboration. It's not always, of course, to modern tastes, but you can see that it produced a wonderful treasure effect. And in fact, the house became a treasure house under Oxley's, with Oxley's collections. And then something very different again. Uh, a new cemetery was required, a new burial ground for Headingley. Uh, land was chosen at Lawns Wood. That's the land, just a spot of land which was thought to be absolutely beautiful with trees and so on. Three Headingley architects, and he was living in Headingley then, of course, were, were approached about designing the cemetery buildings, and he won the contract. The architect published the plans. You'll see that there are two sides to the two chapels that have been proposed, the dissenters chapel on the left, uh, and then the Anglican chapel on the right, with a connected by a cloister. That was the drawing of it, and here it is today exactly as planned. He even planned the lodge at the gate, which had to have space for the registrar and for laying out the body. And he designed the grounds themselves. This extract from the 1906 map shows you how the cemetery then was designed with these winding paths. It's quite unusual. Uh, for graveyards, they're mostly much more regular in design. It's rather romantic winding paths through the trees. It's part of Corson's ideas for the cemetery. And then on to another project, all within this relatively short space of time. Uh, the town had been without a theatre. Uh, the old theatre had burnt down and it was proposed and all the great and the good were involved in this, as you can see from this list of names, uh, 
were involved in setting up a company to raise money to build a new theater and opera house. And this was meant to lift the town really to the level of the great cities of Europe and of London and London itself. Leeds had to have a really top class theater and opera house. This was the prospectus, and we have a copy of this in the, in the Thorsby Society collection. Uh, and you'll see at the bottom there that the architect is George Corson. And he was very much involved in this project from the start. But the person who carried out much of the work, the detailed work on this project, was his chief assistant called James Robinson Watson, who was also from Don Fries. Uh, he was younger than George Corson. He was a follower, as it were, from Dumfries, from the same training ground with Walter Newell. And, and it said that he went and travelled around Europe to look at the theatres uh, and opera houses there to get a clear idea of what would be the best solution for the Leeds. Right, they bought the land. Corson was one of the people involved in buying the land. Here's his design, or their design, for the frontage of the theatre. A very elaborate and very theatrical design. It's not clear that all the little statues that are shown there, and I think what looks like a roundel in the middle of the entrance of William Shakespeare, I imagine, it's not clear that those ever were built because later images don't show them. But here it is, a very dramatic design in Gothic and Moorish detail, turrets, everything you can think of, really. Uh, and inside, a very splendid decoration with tiles, with, uh, it's a sort of papier-mâché kind of plaster work, um, gilded, crimson and gold, and the boast made that it was every possible action had been taken to make it fireproof after all the fires that had destroyed theatres in Leeds previously. On the opening evening, November 1878, uh, it was a grand affair, a very grand occasion. George Corson got a round of applause, and so did Watson. And uh, everybody thought that they had created there that Leeds now had the finest theatre, one of the finest theatres in Europe. That's how it looks today. It's really very little unchanged. We should say that behind the stage, the more the backstage facilities, and of course the assembly rooms to the side, which had shops underneath, which were meant to create some income. Uh, all of this was much admired. Um, and there was a proposal, when the proposal came up to list the building, it was actually opposed by the then owners, but it was listed nevertheless. And of course, it was bought by the council in 1970 and now belongs, belongs to Leeds. And in that same year, 1876, George Corson put in, he entered the competition for the building of the new municipal buildings. These were the buildings that were going to house the council's various activities, including the free library including other activities as well. And he put in this design, this classical, sort of classical Italianate design, not at all like the grand, and he won the competition. There, was a, there were over 20 entries. He won it with this design. It's interesting here to note that the frontage here, this is the frontage on Culverley Street, to the side of the town hall, 
he said it had to fit in. If he'd chosen the design, he'd thought about it, that it would fit in with the side of the town hall, which had been built, well, less than 20 years earlier. Uh, but of course, you never actually get this view. Here it looks as though there's a great square in front of the building, which of course there isn't, in fact. But I'm just going to move to something else in the same, before we go back to that, move to something that happened in the same year. And I think it was winning that competition plus the Grand Theatre project that gave him the authority and the leading edge in the architectural world in Leeds to propose that there should be an association of Leeds architects. And he that was taken ahead and then he was elected president and his presidential address stressed some of the important features that all architects should be thinking about. He was setting standards or trying to set standards, having regard to adjoining buildings, not making them all the same, but thinking about how the adjoining building, how the whole street would look remembering the importance of depth and shadow and building strongly, always going one step further than necessary and avoiding poverty of design and materials, choose quality. These were important points that were being made and I've just commented on the bottom that it helped, the association helped to establish standards to encourage architects, there was lots of work, so they weren't really in competition, and promote the common cause of improvement to the town. And let's go back to this, his winning design. It was going to take eight years before this building was finished. And he commented at one point that he'd made over a thousand drawings during of, of aspects of the design during the years of construction. This is how it looks now, but of course it's cramped in a sense by being just along the side of Culverley Street. In this little snapshot from the 1906 uh, OS map, you can see that the municipal buildings was crammed in, really, between all the surrounding buildings. And in particular, down in front, where it says Centenary Street, there were buildings that shut the rather splendid architecture of the municipal building, shut them away from sight. Those buildings were demolished in the 1930s to create this open space, which means we now do see the side of the building. I think one tends to think of this as the front, but in fact, it is the side of the original design. There was to be, there was a change of plan, in fact, because originally the school board was going to be inside the municipal buildings, but then they had power, they were given power to build their own offices, and it was agreed that George Corson would continue as the architect of the new school, build, school board building and keep it in matching style. But there was a tight budget, which nevertheless he managed to keep to. In, in general, good at budgeting. Here's the building now, just as it was, of course, all put to different uses now. There's the rather proud crest uh, right up at the top of the building over the entrance. And these rather charming little statues that are in the entrance, it's worth peering in to see them there. They look like model children, beautifully dressed. And they're by the lead sculptor who again worked quite often with Corson, uh, Matthew Taylor. They said what the little boy said to be a portrait of his son. And uh, there was question, questions were raised about their dress, but as you see there, they're certainly very beautifully dressed, uh, which may not have been the case for all the children at the time. Here's the 
opening ceremony in 1884. It had taken that long to get the building finally completed. It was held in the Tiled Hall, which was the reading room at the time, and was followed by a banquet where they were all slapping each other on the back for having created such a wonderful building. Here's the Tiled Hall as it looked then, and mostly the press raved about it, sumptuous and people's palace and so on. Though there were people who felt that the whole thing was way over the top and wanton extravagance. There's the tiled hall now. It was the, it started off as the reading room, though people said it was so magnificent and probably nobody would be reading. They'd be looking up at the ceiling. Then it became a sculpture gallery before the uh, art gallery was final, finally extended. Uh, and now, of course, it's the cafe. And it's always worth them going through into the main entrance hall and looking up the staircases to this wonderful interior of the hall. These pictures are just looking up at all lit from above again with these elaborate carvings, mostly by John Wormel Apple Yard, whose name actually appears on this roundel with Corson's name. It meant to be people paying their rates there in the picture. And these amazing animals that crouch on the banister, the whole thing, awful, lit, beautifully lit, in marbles and ceramics, different stones tiling everywhere. So a fantastic interior, it's always worth revisiting. Here's his visiting card after that achievement. He proudly called himself architect of the municipal offices. He entered competition for two other municipal buildings in Glasgow and Nottingham. And in Glasgow, interestingly, he did win the first prize, but it was rather grudgingly given to him. And there was a lot of dispute over the brief that had been given for the competition for the offices. It was felt that not enough money had been granted and the brief was too restrictive. And in the end, he did not get the job of actually being the architect for the final offices. So although he won the prize, uh, he didn't get the building. And, and perhaps that's one of the aspects that kept him in Leeds. He didn't have to travel elsewhere. He stayed within the Leeds area. He had to suffer, I must say, a lot of insult over this Glasgow. The Glasgow architects, of course, uh, got together and uh, accused him of designing a design that was uninteresting and heavy. And somebody said Palladio would have turned in his grave. Maybe because of that bid for Glasgow, or maybe just in order to have a retreat well away from Leeds and back in his homeland of Scotland, he bought or he built, he had built for him at Gareloch, right over on the west coast of Scotland for, I've put in it's 450 miles away. It must have taken him a very long time to get there, even with the train up to Inverness. Uh, but there he is right on the west coast and that's a place where he retreats as he gets older and with his family more and more. So this, now we see some of his, perhaps he's got time finally for some personal life. He gets married in 1882 and uh, he's 23 years older than his wife. She seems to play no part in Leeds local life. They lived at Dunearn and they had three sons, but none of them became architects. And it's possible that increasingly they disappeared off to Scotland. But he took an interest in local affairs in Headingley, and we find 
is marked his designs in various places here, St. Michael's Parish Centre in Bennett Road, which was opened in 1884. Uh, it's now been refurbished. Uh, that was his design. And along Shire Road in this property development of the previously cardigan land, he builds, he's responsible for various houses. These are two semi-detached there. And again, over the road, this building, two semi-detached semi houses uh, made to look like one big house, uh, which is now Haley's Hotel. And across the road again, conversion of the old farm in Shire Oak Road into one grand house. This was previously the College of Music. And interestingly, its new name, converted now into little houses, uh, is now called Courts and Court. So his name has been brought back for this development. That's a bit of mock Tudor that he added on to the front one of the cottages there. It is a very old building in origin. So by the 1890s, he's winding down. He's still in demand, uh, sometimes to judge competition, architectural competitions, to speak. He speaks again and becomes president again of the Leeds Architectural Association. But his only real major work is the extension to the general infirmary. And here he chose to match the original Gilbert Scott design. He built this loggia, which unfortunately now has been blocked in, and the home on the right there, the nurse's home, which is uh, all in the same style. And he starts to sell up, he, he moved, to one of his houses, but he sold the property, he sold Dunearn and other property that he owned along Shire Oak Road. And he finished living in a small house in Woodland Park Road in Headingley. He did take on a partner briefly, briefly one of his old pupils, uh, and they did do one or two jobs still there there's a very fine house Apsley house 1903 which he did with his partner but one gets a sense that he's apparently he was not always well and he's pulling back from work now and he died in 1910 and he's buried at Lawnswood not in the old it was the winding paths that he had designed himself but in the new part of the cemetery he and he's right there at the beginning and it's a very modest celtic cross uh, this is what it says at the bottom and you'll see that it parks back to his um Fries origins uh and there's no mention of leads though it does say architect uh, it's when she left Leeds when he died, but she, she is also buried in this. Just to finish, I'd just like to comment really on what I think is most impressive about him, looking at what he did, um, a commitment of time and effort, I think, into all the work that he did, enormous care and attention to detail particularly in, well, in interiors and exteriors, but he doesn't forget the interior, uh, richness of decoration and a range of styles, but a sense, I think, of quality, of quality as well. He comes over as a rather modest man when somebody congratulated him on the municipal buildings and said, surely this is your masterpiece. Mr. Corson, he said, well, from the comments I've heard, it's not entirely a failure, I think. And maybe that sums up his rather modest approach to work that we're still able to enjoy today. <laughs>